Ed. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the Innovation Day, um, to the breeding session of the Innovation Day. My name is Katy. I'm a canola breeder and also R&D lead for North America Canola with New Seed Canada. Um, the theme of this session um, is to understand the breeder's uh, toolbox a little better. Uh, we have four excellent talks. Each of them will take about 15 minutes, and then we have a 15 minute for uh, Q&A. Um, our first speaker uh, is uh, joining us virtually and missing out on this very beautiful Saskatoon December weather. He's joining us from uh, UC Davis, Dr. Bradley Till. Uh, he's from Seattle, traveled to Austria, and spent two years in Chile. Uh, Bradley returned to the United States and joined the UC Davis Veterinary Genetics Laboratory as a bioinformatics programmer. He continues to collaborate with plant researchers in developed and developing countries. Uh, the title of his talk is Induced Mutations and Tillings in the Era of, of Genome Editing. Uh, without any further ado, Dr. Thiel. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I hope. Can you see my screen? Okay. So I'll start talking. I hope you can hear me. We cannot hear you. Okay, hang on. Okay, how about now? No? Try a backup headphone. We can hear you, Bradley. You can hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay, all right, I switched headphones. I apologize for that. Um, it worked last night. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you in this session. And what I'm going to do is, is give you a little bit of background on the history and use of induced mutations uh, for plant breeding and the reverse genetics method known as tilling. And then at the end of my talk, uh, I'll try to tie this into uh, genome editing and uh, how and when you might want to choose one or the other, or do a combination of the both. Sorry, Bradley, for interrupting you. Yes. We can't see your screen. You can't see my screen? No, we cannot. Okay, all right, sorry. Wow, how about now? Yes, we do, thank you. Okay, all right. Yeah, it has to do with my Linux machine not being happy about Zoom. All right, so, so uh, anyway, it's just the title slide. So I'll, I'll start with a background on, on um, Induced mutation. So the, the idea that you can create novel genetic variation orders of magnitude faster than happens spontaneously in nature was discovered uh, more than 80 years ago. And very quickly, plant scientists picked this up and started to use it to develop new crop varieties. And the first uh, variety uh, created using ionizing radiation uh, was released in the 1930s. Uh, today, there are more than 3,300 uh, officially released mutant crop varieties that you can find in a database curated by the uh, FAO IAEA joint program in Austria. And on the left here is just a pie chart of the distribution. There's more than 200 species present, the distribution by, by crop. And you can see number one is rice. Of course, that's probably the most important food security crop in the world. Follow that barley. Uh, you know, for uh, food and also malting. And then the third one is chrysanthemums. And I think this highlights really the broad range of traits you can find if you dig into this database, uh, abiotic, biotic, stress resistance, quality, and even things like flower color. And there are some very important commercial varieties that have been released, uh, like uh, red grapefruit, Rio red grapefruit, uh, disease-resistant peppermint. I mentioned barley, golden promise is important in the malting industry. And also in developing countries, things like high iron rice have had a huge impact in the farmers in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Now, induced mutations are, are caused by mutagenizing plants, and you can do 
use different methods to mutagenize plants. Uh, physical radiation like gamma and x-ray are quite commonly used uh, in mutation breeding. And you also have examples of chemical mutagenesis, different types of, of combinations as well. Now, most mutation breeding is, is what I would call forward genetics, and I'll use those terms today, so I'll just define them very quickly. So in forward genetics, it's sort of traditional genetics. You have a mutant population, and you put those in the greenhouse or the field, and you look for a phenotype, and oftentimes they're just released. Sometimes they're direct releases. Sometimes there's some backcrossing or intergression pyramiding happening. Uh, you can then take pains to go and look at the, the interesting plants and find out what happened at the DNA level. Uh, however, that's often not done, but that would be the path of forward genetics. And then in contrast, starting in the, for plants in, a, in the 1990s, uh, people were developing methods to specifically target mutations in genes in plants. And uh, if you start with the genotype and ask a question, oh, I think this gene maybe is important for leaf color, and you mutate it to ask that question to address that hypothesis, that's called reverse genetics because you start with the genotype and you end up with the phenotype. So I'll start with an example of forward genetics. And I, I know that this is a canola meeting, but maybe you guys had a banana uh, for breakfast or two. And the, the one nice example of, of plant mutation breeding is in bananas because bananas are, are sterile and parthenocarpic, they're seedless, and they, they have a very narrow genetic base. So you know, inducing mutations can really create a lot of new genetic diversity that can be used by the breeder. And the most successful, banana variety is called Navaria, and it was created and released in Malaysia in the 1990s. It's early flowering, so it allows it to escape uh, things like disease and tropical storm damage. However, nobody really knew what was going on at the DNA level. So a few years ago, we decided to investigate this, and we did what's called low coverage whole genome sequencing to look for really large structural variants. And, and by low coverage, I mean about 6x here. And, and this is real data here from chromosome uh, Five to just show you what it looks like. So we're sequencing, we plotted on the mean coverage every 3,000 base pairs of both the Novaria mutant variety and the unmutagenized parent called Grand Nain. And as we march down the chromosome here, you see the colors are all overlapping and then you see the colors separate here. And that's indicative of a single copy deletion in the mutant variety that's 3.8 million base pairs, so really large uh, changes. So we were pretty happy to see that. That's kind of what we expected in bananas, but because it's vegetatively propagated, we wanted to make sure Previous work we'd done, we, we knew we could mutagenize using a chemical mutagen called EMS that causes mostly point mutations. And that led us to um, really uh, take the next step forward when I was working at the UN to try to develop a project to address really the biggest, most pressing issue uh, in bananas, which is the disease uh, uh, Fusarium will tropical race for. And it, it's spreading around the world and it can really do a lot of damage because the plantations are all clones of each other. So the idea would be to then, you know, do mutagenesis. We can't use seed, so we take meristems and then isolate those and use this kind of sequencing to, to make sure that we've created mutations. This is real data. So you can just see here and here where the arrows are that there's some big changes happening, these big deletions happening in, in the banana genome. We also see some insertions. So we got the green light to start this project and uh, we, uh, collected a whole bunch of collaborators with different expertise. For this part of the project, uh, we partnered with Altus Viljoen's group at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And he had uh, talked to Duroy, a company in South Africa, to donate the plantlets. So we had all this material that we could mutagenize when I was working in Austria. And then we sent the material after we optimized the mutagenesis over to Taiwan, where they had the facilities to do pot level screening for fusarium resistance and, and just you can see here in the upper left corner, the pseudostem of a banana that doesn't show any signs of diseases and in the bottom right, a severe disease symptom. Uh, so these are rated uh, zero to four. And what we can see with both chemical mutagenesis and, and with gamma radiation that we have uh, percentages of plants that aren't, aren't showing any disease symptoms at this developmental stage. And those are those are continuing to be looked at. So we have a few work on bananas. You can welcome to contact me. We have a bunch of uh, book chapters out and methodology chapters out. And if you're interested in x-ray and gamma radiation, uh, we recently, just a couple of weeks ago, published a paper in Rice from Madagascar, where we look more carefully at the 
density and spectrum of mutations coming from these two uh, irradiation sources. And we see both single nucleotide variations and also large structural variations, which is kind of interesting. OK, so that's an example of forward genetics. Uh, we'll jump to reverse genetics. And you're, I think you're going to hear more about tilling in this session. So I'll, I'll go through this a little quickly and then to save time. And then, and then you, you can hear more about it later. But in this case, we're looking at, uh, in this example, we're mutagenizing seed. And you make basically uh, single seed descent immortalized lines uh, from a single plant. And you take the DNA from each line. And you take the seed from those lines. And then you have libraries that you can screen at your leisure. And the idea here is that if you have uh, a high enough mutation density in enough plants, you can guarantee multiple mutations in any gene in the genome. So then it's just the act of finding the mutations. There's a number of different ways to do that. Um, when uh, we use, uh, we pool genomic DNAs and we do PCR and we sequence those PCR products using Illumina sequencing, and that's called uh, tilling by sequencing. Uh, one thing before I leave this slide, I should say that, you know, my last name is quite familiar with that. That's a s coincidental. So targeting induced local lesions in genomes was a, a name coined by uh, Claire McCallum, uh, Steve Hennikoff, and Luca Komai. So can't take credit for that. Uh, so the example I'll give is in tomato. And, and the reason I choose tomato, it's a collaboration I had with Rami Sharma's group in India at the University of Hyderabad with Pratik Gupta being the, the uh, then graduate student who's first author on this. In polyploids, it's relatively easy to get a very high density of, of chemically induced mutations, but this is this can be problematic in diploids. And one of the clever things that uh, Ramesh's group did was do a double mutagenesis. So mutagenize, recover the seeds, and remutagenize. And that helps gain enough mutations before you hit a kind of cytotoxic barrier and, and kill the plants or make them sterile. One of the features of this, as I said, is you pool the genomic DNAs together prior to doing PCR. And uh, in this work, we looked at 64 to 192 X. And what this looks like at the, at the sequence level, so these are plots of the frequency of variations. Uh, and look at the, how low these frequencies are, because imagine if you have a pool of 100, you know, that's 1% uh, uh, variant. So you have mutations that are unique and found in only one plant in every pool. So to help find the real signal over the noise, what we do is we do three-dimensional pooling. So each mutant line is found in three different pools, in three different unique pools. And so a true mutation is found three times, and uh, two examples of this. But you can really see that the higher the pooling you, you go, the closer you are to noise and the harder it is to do. So there's been a lot of work on different using different software to call these variants and, and how to do it. We tend to use three nowadays, Pratik use six. And, it, and a more recent paper looks at this in pools of 96, uh, where we're looking at natural accession. So if you're not interested in mutations, you can look at this Rye paper and, and see how you can use it to mine germplasm collections of natural variants. Uh, let's see, I'm going a little bit long. So uh, what I'll do is I'll go through this very quickly. One of the things that we're it's really kind of been a passion of mine is is to get tools and methods to everywhere everybody around the world you know regardless of of your budget and your laboratory infrastructure so we've been working for a number of years to make things low cost and non toxic and available to everybody to really unleash the power of genomics and i'll just point you to this 2021 biotechniques paper you don't need liquid nitrogen you you can collect things on silica. You can make your own DNA extraction kit at one-tenth the cost of a commercial kit. If you don't have the equipment to even photograph your gels, you can build one out of a cardboard box and blue LED lights. And then what really excites me now is at the computational end, computers are getting cheap. So you can get refurbished computers. We're just about to buy a new workstation that has 512 gigabytes of RAM, and it's going to cost us about $1,700 US dollars. So that's, it's incredibly cheap. So I think all of the things are available. And of course, to do DNA sequencing nowadays, you just put uh, DNA in a tube and uh, send it off to a company. Okay, so now we're getting to the last part where I want to put this in context, this, this kind of old method of using induced mutations with a relatively new twist, and new being the last 20 years or so, of using mutations for reverse genetics. And how does this fit with genetic variation in 2022? Uh, now, this is a, a figure from a review paper that Christian Jung, who's at, at uh, Christian Albrecht's University in Kiel, and I wrote that came out just about a year ago. 
Um, there's a lot of, so the, you know, the plant scientist today has a lot of sources for genetic variation. Of course, genetic variation is the fuel for phenotypes. Uh, so you could look at land races and wide crosses and, and things like transformation and cell fusion. But I want to focus on random mutagenesis, which is what I've been talking about, and targeted mutagenesis like CRISPR. And the question is, like, when might you want to choose one versus the other? Uh, so uh, I, we have a kind of a decision tree and a flow diagram in the, in the review paper where we discuss this in, in some detail. Now, obviously, you start out with your desired trait or phenotype that you're looking for. And then you can ask the question, you know, do you know any candidate genes that you might want to target? Um, and for example, in banana, I told you, well, there are target genes for disease resistance, but there's hundreds of them. And so in that case, we just made a decision to do for genetics and let the phenotype do the talking. Uh, pretty straightforward. And you you can do that and be successful without any molecular biology. So if you don't know the candidate genes or have too many, you might just want to go through a forward genetic path and look for uh, phenotypes that you're interested. In. Then you can do, you know, back crossing, get rid of the background mutations, pyramid any alleles, so what have you. If you do know candidate genes and you do have some strong candidates, you can then do a reverse genetic method and you can choose between something like CRISPR or random mutagenesis and tilling. Now, what might uh, uh, affect your decision would be issues like, for example, a biological issue. So in some plant species, it's still hard to transform them. It's hard, depending on how you're doing the CRISPR, but it's still hard to get things in and, and get CRISPR working. So that may take quite a bit of time. And you may have a constraint that pushes you towards mutagenesis. And so far, we've seen that you can mutagenize pretty much anything. So you, you know that should work. Uh, so you might go that path. Now, there are also IP and regulatory issues. If you're exporting material, you may, depending on where you're exporting it to, you may not want a, a CRISPR uh, plant, in which case you could even still use CRISPR and use it to validate your gene. So you could do very quickly do CRISPR and say, aha, this gene is giving me the trait that I want, but I don't want a CRISPR plant for whatever reason. I'll go back to, and, and, and start over with the mutant population with those genes, and I should be able to find those and create an elite line with the improved phenotype. So I think there's a lot of combinatorial approaches, and really it depends a lot on the species and also on what your objectives are and what you're going to do with that material. And what I should say with me, Induced mutations, you know, it's prior art. It's been used for many years. There's no IP on that. So uh, you can distribute mutated seed anywhere in the world without regulation or extra paperwork. OK, just to summarize then, uh, I said that uh, I told you that induced mutations produce novel variations very higher orders of magnitude faster than spontaneous mutations. And it's been a successful approach since the 1930s. And like I said, so far, we everywhere we've looked, we've been able to induce mutation. Sometimes it's a little challenging like tomato, but we can get over that. Uh, you can use mutations and combine that with a reverse genetic approach to find mutations in specific genes of interest. So that's sort of similar to CRISPR, but you do have background mutations. And in that review paper I pointed to, uh, Christian does talk quite a bit about removing background uh, mutations using genomic background selection. So if you're doing that, you might want to read that. And of course, your specific objectives and, and your limitations may influence uh, which approach that you want to take. So with that, uh, I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, lots of people, I should say lots of people have worked with me over the years, a lot of collaborative projects. It's been a lot of fun, but I don't have time to read everybody off here. Thank you.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, organizer, for giving me this opportunity to pre present our work. So my talk today is about applying CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to improve club root, uh, uh, canola club root resistance. So first of all, I would like uh, where I should. Oh, okay. So first of all, I would like to introduce our research team, which come from two labs. One from University of Saskatchewan, led by Dr. Wei Xiao, which is also the PI in this project. Uh, another group from AFC, led by Dr. Gary Peng. Uh, I want to highlight here Dr. Rui Wen, uh, who did a, a, a lot of work in this study. So thanks uh, previous uh, speakers has a very good, good uh, introduction about uh, club root and uh, genome editing. So that make, my, make me uh, much more easy. So club root disease caused by uh, fungal-like fungal protein, the plasmodia alpha brattica. And the formation of, uh, it can form the uh, club-shaped uh, gauze on infected roots, uh, resulting in disrupt and uh, water and nutrition uptake. Uh, and uh, they, they will cause wilting, starting, and the premature senescence symptoms on the plants. So club root uh, was uh, first found in 2003 in Western Canada. After that, thousands of infested seed, uh, fields has been identified. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh. Um, uh, club root caused the millions of dollars lost uh, uh, for canola industry in, in Canada. Uh, there have a, uh, oh, sorry, I, uh, I think this is the wrong, wrong slide. Sorry, <laughs> this is the wrong, I updated this morning. Sorry. <laughs> Can I, can I change to the new one? I already uploaded this one. Oh, okay, ne never mind. So, okay, so there are uh, uh, several ways that can control this disease, uh, like uh, crop rotation, uh, increase the soil pH, and the seed treatment. But the most important way is uh, use the genetic resistance. Uh, so like uh, previous uh, uh, speakers talk, uh, much rely on the arching uh, immediate uh, breeding uh, strategy. So however, this strategy uh, is facing some challenge and uh, limitation. Uh, uh, one thing is uh, arching triggered risk specific resistance is very easily to break down by new uh, involved pasture type that cannot uh, provide a durable resistance. Uh, another uh, limitation is uh, so far the club root R gene uh, most identified from the brassic wrapper. Uh, Introducing those uh, alleles uh, uh, is time consuming and uh, labor intensive, so cannot uh, keep pace uh, with the fast evolving uh, pathogen. Uh, in our lab, instead of to look at the R gene, we focus on another uh, group of uh, gene called the susceptible, uh, susceptibility genes. Which contribute to the uh, uh, which con contribute to the pathogen uh, susceptibility. The idea is uh, we use the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to uh, knock out those gene, will be reduce the susceptibility, then in turn increase the resistance to the plant. So uh, club root disease is a perfect uh, disease model which can use this S gene strategy. Uh, to improve resistance based on several uh, uh, reasons. So first, the uh, club root pathogen is a typical batch of uh, pathogen, which can um, uh, manipulate a host to form the metabolome uh, sink uh, around the infection site. Uh, 
many many susceptible uh, genes has been identified uh, in club uh, uh, in club uh, in canola. So from the canola side, the whole genome sequence uh, is available, and uh, uh, merger the transformation too uh, also available. That make uh, uh, gene genome uh, genome editing more easier in brassica neighbor than other crop species. So most importantly, uh, brassica neighbor uh, close to the model plants are Arabidopsis. That means all knowledge information learned from Arabidopsis can be easily translated to the uh, brassica neighbors. Uh, from the CRISPR-Cas9 point of view, uh, they, they can provide a precise, uh, precise target mutation instead of a random uh, mutation. And it has uh, multiplex uh, editing capacity, so that can overcome uh, gene, gene redundancy issue in brassica neighbors, nepa especially for S gene. As uh, uh, not like R gene, much more it's a dominant allele, but uh, S gene is uh, more like the recessive allele. So uh, then, uh, compared to the conventional breeding uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing will re reduce the breeding time and the labor. So uh, what we do in our lab is we first discover uh, S genes in modern plants and uh, functional validate their, function, uh, their involvement uh, uh, for the club root uh, infection. Then we, uh, we search the oscillogous gene in brassica neighbor, uh, use the genome editing to knock out those genes, hopefully can increase the resistance. So here I want to share one of uh, S gene we are working on. Uh, it's called the UBC13 uh, gene. So this gene is a key E2 enzyme responsible for lysine 63 linked uh, poly ubiquitination. So our lab has uh, previously, previously shown uh, it uh, play in, important role in plant immunity. So there have two copies of UBC13 gene in uh, Arabidopsis. We previously we generate uh, uh, TDN insertion mutant for each gene and the double mutant uh, and the complementation line, uh, which we will use in this study. We inoculate those plants with uh, club root parcel type uh, 3H. As you can see here, um, uh, type and complementation lines show the uh, severe uh, disease symptom Suggests uh, the plant is uh, wilting and uh, uh, stunting and uh, quickly die after four weeks uh, uh, inoculation. Uh, look at the root root phenotype, uh, wire type, and the complementation lines. Uh, the roots are all damaged and can form the uh, big big uh, gall on their roots. But uh, uh, UBC13 uh, plants still uh, alive and grow healthy. They they can remain their main main root. So then we monitor the bare mass of a pathogen in the infected roots. Uh, as you can see from this photo, uh, UBC13 mutant uh, uh, produce uh, much less uh, zoom spore ranger uh, in the infected uh, infected cells compared to the wild type that point uh, uh, by the uh, white uh, arrow head. Uh, this, this, this result is also confirmed by qPCR by test the two pathogen housekeeping genes. Uh, then we, want, uh, we, we wonder when UBC13 has, uh, uh, mutant has the resistance to other parcel type. We, then we inoculate the two more uh, new, new parcel types, 5X and 3A. As you can see here, uh, wear type and uh, complementation lines has uh, highest uh, disease severity, uh, but uh, UBC13 has just uh, intermediate uh, disease severity. So then we're wondering what, what kind of mechanism UBC13 involved during the club root infection. Uh, Previously, our lab showed that UBC13 is involved in oxygen signaling pathway, as you can see from this figure. Uh, UBC13 mutant uh, does not respond to uh, oxygen treatment. So, uh, meanwhile, other uh, many studies have pointed out oxygen is uh, associated to the club root infection, contribute to the, the susceptible, uh, susceptible factor. So, then we test uh, uh, 
some auxin responsive gene in UBC13 after inoculation. As you can see from this figure, uh, some of those genes uh, highly induced in viral type showing that uh, black bar, but uh, uh, not induced in UBC13 mutant. Uh, uh, after, oh, okay, after all, uh, after all, uh, we, sh uh, we make the conclusion that uh, UBC13 is a susceptible factor contribute to the club root, uh, club root, club root uh, infection, uh, most uh, likely through the uh, auxin uh, signaling pathway. Then we think uh, we can uh, edit this gene in brassica neighbor, hopefully can improve the uh, resistance. Then we move to the brassica neighbor. Uh, instead of, uh, 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 not like uh, Arbidopsis only have uh, two copies of gene, in brassica neighbor, so we found that there have 12 of uh, UBC13 genes, so that is a surprise to us. Um, uh, they, can, uh, they can group into two su uh, subgroups. So we cloned all those genes and did a functional uh, study on those genes. Uh, they, they all show the classic UBC13 functions. Uh, this work uh, uh, has been submitted to the uh, BMS, BMS uh, plant biology. So then we will try to edit those genes. Instead of uh, to shut down all genes, we, uh, we wanted uh, to check uh, if there have uh, if a different subgroup have a different function, so therefore we first uh, first the ta target uh, five of those genes which uh, share the identical sequence in their first exon. Based on that, we designed the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 vector, did the transformation, and. Uh, uh, after PCR and uh, Sanger sequencing, we can identify the uh, indel muta mutation in, in the trans transform plants. Uh, in the end, we got uh, 78 transplants. And uh, uh, there, uh, finally, we identified uh, several quintuple mutants, uh, which can uh, knock out all five genes uh, in, in one generation. So then we test the disease uh, on those mutants. So here is the disease test results. As you can see, those mutants show the significant uh, reduced uh, disease severity compared to the viral type. So this result is very exciting uh, for us because this shows that this uh, S-gene uh, breeding strategy works very well for the club root uh, resistant improvement. Then we also test uh, if this mutant uh, affect uh, yield. Uh, this uh, preliminary uh, result show that uh, not affect uh, yield too much. Uh, some lines uh, even uh, increase the yield. Uh, okay, so ongoing and future work, we will continue to investigate uh, UBC13 mediate uh, club root susceptibility. May, maybe uh, continue uh, knock out more uh, club root uh, UBC13 genes in Brax's neighbor. Uh, Another new project just started this year. We found uh, we got the funding from Saskatoon and the WGRF. Is instead of to knock out a single gene in this new project, we try to knock out uh, hundreds uh, potential S gene. Uh, use the CRISPR Cas9 to build the knockout mutant uh, for club root resistant improvement. Another pro new project we just started this year, we want to apply nanotechnology to advance uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So uh, current uh, transformation uh, method in brassica neighbors uh, has some issues, such as the, the efficiency is much dependent on the genotype, uh, and also has, uh, still can introduce the foreign gene into the genome. So we hopefully we use the nanoparticle as the genetic cargo to, to deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 into the plant cell. So then we can over, over, overcome those issues in the future. Okay, in the end, I would like to thank uh, all our research team and the collaborators and also the fund, all fund agency uh, supported this project. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, 
Raju Datla from the Global Institute for Food Security. Um, he's a program lead at Global Institute for Food Security prior to joining GIFS. He was the principal research officer at the National Research Council of Canada. He has over 35 years of research experience conducting research in several strategic areas of plant biology using the model system Arabidopsis and crop species like canola, flax, and wheat. Uh, the title of his talk is Establishment and Applications of Brassica Tilling Resources. So good morning. Uh, thanks, Katy, uh, for the introduction and the organizers for the invitation. And uh, we wanted to present uh, today uh, the progress that we are making uh, in establishing tilling population in Brassica, Napas, and uh, poten its potential applications. Where we discuss a few of those opportunities. I think uh, during the meeting. Uh, the importance of canola crop for Canada has been very well highlighted. And uh, despite many advances that are happening in canola, uh, still there are some challenges to remain. And some of the challenges are related to the climate change, sustainability, and uh, um, resiliency. So to drive those, uh, meet those challenges, uh, we need the resources uh, that can uh, contribute and provide the, uh, the necessary tools and technologies. And the previous, uh, the first speaker has introduced the uh, induced mutation uh, tilling as a, one of the best resources one can use uh, to harness uh, the diversity for the targets that we are interested in. And he has already introduced, I don't want to go into detail, but the one thing I wanted to uh, point out, uh, the tilling resource uh, is uh, induced mutagenesis, uh, except you are putting into a genomic context uh, and genomic tools uh, uh, to exploit that resource. Uh, and here we can do forward genetics and reverse genetics. Uh, both uh, have an important uh, uh, salient features uh, that can be exploited and introduced into the crops, uh, crop background. So again, uh, the previous speaker uh, has introduced uh, uh, one thing I wanted to say that uh, it was developed by Steven Hennikoff and uh, Luca Komai, uh, and this technology has been uh, uh, since this uh, first uh, uh, description has been very widely uh, used in not only in plants and crops, uh, in many other model systems uh, uh, to understand the functionalities of the genes uh, uh, and uh, the, the genomes that are sequenced uh, are providing. Uh, some important uh, insights into uh, how these mutations uh, and their implications in uh, biological processes. So the, using the uh, tilling approach, uh, uh, George Hahn, a professor at the University of British Columbia, uh, as, as part of uh, a previous Genome Canada project, uh, DOTM, so he started uh, uh, developing the tools, uh, tilling tools uh, for Brassica Nepis. So this project, uh, DOTM, was uh, uh, funded by Genome Canada, and it was led by Wilf Keller, uh, Randy Westlake and Gopalan Sarvaraj, and it was supported by uh, genome, several genome centers. So uh, in this uh, tilling resource, uh, already the, the first uh, speaker has uh, outlined the strategies and the steps involved. So uh, here, what George Group did uh, and used the uh, DH12075 uh, you know, double haploid uh, line to mutagenize and uh, develop the M2, M2, M2 population. And he has developed about 3,500 lines. And I think the strategy for, for, for screening and mining this resource using the 3D, 3D, 3D pooling strategy that Bradley has described. So this resource has been developed and it was used for screening the, in this particular case, so uh, George Lab provided the expertise and the resources uh, to perform the uh, reverse genetic screens uh, for the Brassica community in Canada. And they have done about 30 target genes 
and these genes represent uh, diverse pathways and processes, lipid metabolism, uh, sugar metabolism, and uh, transcriptional factors, signaling factors. Uh, so, and in every one of the genes that they have done killing, they found mutations. And about uh, close to 50% of these mutations are non synonymous, uh, uh, representing amino acid changes, which can contribute to the diversity of the uh, protein functionalities. And in addition to the protein uh, uh, mutations uh, corresponding to the protein coding sequence, they also found mutations uh, quite uh, widely distributed in the regulatory promoter sequences. So this research was done and uh, proof of concept has been established. Uh, so unfortunately, due to uh, lack of uh, continued funding, uh, that uh, there, uh, at the present, at that time, there is the most of the lines he has developed uh, are sitting in the uh, storage box, and the, we have discussed with him, and he he provided, uh, uh, he asked us to re-establish this uh, killing population for the Nebraska community uh, in Canada, and he provided us the other lines, and then um, we started uh, re-establishing it. So we are, we are making progress uh, in uh, re revising this uh, population. And for uh, re-establishing this uh, popul tilling population, so we have contributions from our uh, um, several members. Uh, so George is continue to be the major source of uh, guidance and uh, support. And that gives uh, Leon and Andy, uh, and then from NRC, Canada, Saskatoon, uh, Shang, they are providing uh, support for re-establishing uh, this resource. In addition to that, uh, our research team at uh, Gibbs uh, um, helping us uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, for the re-establishing re re as well as the uh, performing some forward genetic screens. So currently, all this work was supported by, by uh, Gibbs uh, uh, internal funding. And uh, <clears throat> So one of the major drivers for us uh, uh, to get into this one is uh, to look at the both forward and reverse genetic opportunities using the stealing population to look for the, the important, uh, uh, important rights that are directly connected to the climate change, sustainability, and resiliency. So as shown here, so we are looking at the uh, three important contributors, uh, the water, nutrients, and uh, uh, atmospheric CO2 assimilation uh, capabilities in uh, canola, canola, canola germplasm and uh, tilling variants. So these are three uh, primary targets uh, uh, directly connected to the drought tolerance rights, uh, nutrient use uh, efficiency rights, and uh, photosynthetic uh, efficiency rights. So these are one of the major uh, drivers for us uh, to pursue this uh, tilling population in addition to establishing the resource. So just I will give some of, uh, some of the uh, examples of uh, our forward genetic screens that we performed. So while establishing this resource, uh, uh, we also conducted uh, phenotypic screens. And these phenotypic screens revealed uh, quite a diverse uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, fab, um, phenotypes that are connected to the uh, both the developmental stage, vegetative stages, reproductive stages, and various other uh, uh, processes that are happening during the establishment of uh, um, canola, canola as a plant. So what's shown here are some examples. Uh, uh, well, though it is a polyploid species, uh, because of the, the, the high density of mutations that are present in this population, we are able to detect uh, some interesting uh, developmental uh, uh, phenotypes. The first one on the left uh, is a leaf uh, mutation, is affecting the leaf development. And the, and the middle on the top one is a, a mutation like uh, affecting, the, affecting the flower development. In this particular case, uh, the sepals uh, are uh, converted into kind of needle-like structures. The one below that is uh, an effect on the reproductive phase of development uh, uh, during, si during the silic, uh, uh, um, silic developmental program, affecting the normal program. So, so what you want to say is that uh, though it is a polyploid species, uh, uh, given its uh, you know, high density of mutations, uh, this stilling population, when we do the phenotypic screening, we are, we are observing uh, quite, an, quite a diverse 
developmental at the vegetative and reproductive phases. And some of the other uh, uh, parameters that we looked to while uh, uh, growing these lines is the diverse in flowering time. So there is a reference on the rightmost, uh, the, uh, the wild type or our parental line. And there are some that take longer time to flower, whereas there are others uh, that flower early. So there is a quite a range of uh, uh, flowering times we can observe in this uh, population. And then we also looked at the, uh, the silic, because seed, seed is one of the most important part of the output of the crop. Uh, and seed, uh, from the size point of view and the number point of view, can have a, a significant impact on the yield. So what's shown here is uh, uh, leftmost in each panel, each box is the uh, uh, control, and the right uh, right side is uh, different lines uh, that are showing the variation in the uh, the silic size, and and also and also uh, you see the uh, the num num number of uh, seeds uh, in the in those silics. So we also looked at uh, seed white. Uh, again, uh, uh, we observed a significant diversity in this population, and uh, and uh, yeah, what was shown in the right. Uh, 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 graph uh, is that uh, control compared to the control there are quite a number of lines uh, that uh, show uh, due to the larger seed size and uh, more weight uh, under seed uh, uh, measurements and uh, <clears throat> and we further uh, looked at all the seeds that we have collected from while establishing this uh, uh, tilling line uh, we looked at it very carefully uh, and looked at the seed size. So as shown on the top, uh, there's quite a few that are uh, significantly larger than the uh, larger, than, larger than the controls. And uh, some of these lines, uh, as Bradley pointed out, uh, because of there is high mutation density in the background, we are purifying these lines uh, by back crossing, as well as uh, making crosses uh, uh, to define the genet genetic basis of these uh, uh, large seed size. Uh, lines. So we further looked into those uh, large seed, one of those large seed line. So what is contributing it? Uh, there are two uh, significant contributors to the seed size. One is the seed coat. Other one is the major part is the embryo. So when we looked at the uh, embryo uh, during the seed development, and always we see the, compared to the control, uh, this uh, 205 line and uh, the derivative plants, uh, they show larger embryo size. So it's possible that uh, the underpinning comp genetic components may be uh, affecting the, the seed size. So we are dissecting this particular line further, following through the from uh, fertilization to the maturity. At what phase uh, this particular switch is happening or elaboration is happening to, to produce the larger seed. So th why, why we are interested in the seed is uh, in addition to the other aspects that we are looking at, like photosynthesis, when you improve the, the source capacity, we also need to improve the, the sink capacity. That sink capacity comes from the seed. Unless we have the, the sink capacity, improving the source may or may not uh, uh, translate into the, to the, uh, to the desired improved yield. So from that point of view, we are looking for uh, genes that control the seed size and seed number. So uh, we have not started this work, but uh, Leon, uh, Leon Koshian at uh, Global Institute uh, has established the uh, 2D, um, 2D uh, root phenotyping, and uh, we are going to use that uh, uh, high throughput methods he has developed uh, for uh, uh, screening our uh, killing population in the coming. Yeah. We have not started yet, we'll be set to start this very soon. So in addition to the, the phenotypic uh, uh, screens, uh, we're also looking at uh, physiological rights. Uh, the physiological rights that we are looking at uh, is the stomatal conductance, uh, transpiration, chlorophyll content, and CO2 assimilation. All of these uh, physiological rights are directly connected and relevant to uh, water use efficiency, drought tolerance, and uh, photosynthetic efficiency. So what is shown is uh, some of the, the the uh, physiological measurements we took uh, from this population. Uh, the first one is uh, the CO2 assimilation. So we do see a, a, a range of uh, efficiencies uh, observed in this population. So that is again indicative of uh, the diversity present uh, within this killing population. 
So we also looked at the transpiration rates. Again, we see uh, some diversity in the transpiration rates within the population. And this stomatal conductance, though there is a little bit more uh, variation, still there is some diversity that we can uh, observe within this population. So that's where we are uh, in terms of establishing this uh, uh, tilling population that uh, George Horn has developed. And uh, recently, um, Genome Canada has a call on climate change, and we are developing a proposal uh, focused on establishing the Nebraska tilling and its applications. Additionally, we are also, uh, to capture other diversity, we are also using the, uh, the natural diversity that is uh, available through public and private uh, germplasm collection. So in this program, we are, uh, we are proposing to do the same what I have outlined, uh, establishing the resource, using the resource to conduct the forward genetics, and using the resource to do the uh, reverse genetics uh, from some of the targets that we have identified within our team. And then we also have a social scientist participating in this proposal that will uh, uh, provide their expertise in, um, in uh, economic, uh, ethical, environmental, uh, legal, and uh, um, societal aspects of uh, the technology and its adaptation uh, within the whole project. And, and our, uh, again, our aim is uh, to, uh, over this project, we would like to link uh, this, uh, this, uh, this resource to this Nebraska uh, community resource for applications and the outcomes that are coming from this will be uh, will be kind of linked with the canola uh, industry and stakeholders and that's our uh, plan in this uh, proposal and we appreciate uh, support from canola council sas canola alberta canola and manitoba canola so we've been discussing with uh, uh, doug hill at sas canola during the development of this proposal and also Several members here at the, at the meeting, we've been trying to uh, connect with them. So Nancy from uh, Gibbs is also talking to quite a number of potent, potent uh, industry partners uh, to join in this initiative. This is where we are. And to summarize, uh, this stealing resource is quite, uh, quite good. It is the mutation density is quite high, and we have about 3,500 lines. So we are targeting from for the reestablishment point of view about 20 2500 lines and these tilling lines uh, from based on our analysis uh, at this time uh, are quite uh, showing a lot of diversity in the number of right that are directly uh, relevant and uh, connected to the climate change rights and the sustainability and as well as yield and we believe that uh, this resource can provide kind of number of innovative opportunities for uh, meeting the current and future challenges of Canada Club. So thank you. Well, thanks Raju, that was excellent. Um, our next speaker is uh, Karen Clements from Bayer Crop Science. Uh, he's born and raised in New Zealand. Karen moved to Canada 11 years ago, and he spent his first few years in Canada working in agri-tail before moving to Monsanto, and has been with Bayer and legacy companies for nine years now, starting in agronomy and marketing development before moving to digital farming and now breeding, where he's the North American product development lead for canola. The title of his talk is Precision Breeding with Bayer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to talk here this morning. So mine's, my presentation is going to take a slightly different flavor. Um, really want to get across how we take these awesome scientific discoveries and we implement them into a commercial breeding pipeline. Um, 
Bayer's precision breeding journey is, or, or our breeding journey is constantly iterative and that every time we get close to, uh, to landing at the goal line, we move the goalposts out and it's really this philosophy or this mentality of constant improvement and constant deployment within our breeding pipeline. Happy to hear and, and happy to see that earlier in the week someone also used this tagline, which is a nice affirmation that it's, uh, it's also thought as a, a pretty strong strategy moving forward. But our fundamental shift at the moment within precision breeding is a movement from selecting the best hybrids uh, to designing the best hybrids from the ground up. This is, uh, this is represented in, in some restructuring that we've done throughout our breeding organization um, at a global level uh, more recently. Um, the, the development of, of uh, development and design organizations within breeding. Um, it also has some, some pretty far reaching implications in terms of the, the type of people and the talent that we bring into the organization with now a strong focus moving into um, the fields of genome design and also quantitative genetics uh, that's really going to drive us forward in the future. Just to, to talk and, and swirl a little bit around the overall philosophy here is, is fundamentally for a very long time, decades, um, breeding organizations much like ourselves have taken an approach to breeding where you want to create as much diversity as you possibly can and then you apply selection pressures within that diverse pool. Um, it creates some, some funnels with some very large um, sort of openings at the top and some very steep walls on the side as, as you narrow down and as you apply selection pressures on hybrids for different agronomic traits, for, for um, straight line performance and yield, um, and is a very big footprint uh, way to do it. Um, as you can imagine, when, when you're putting all of those seeds in the ground, that is a massive amount of testing, especially when you're creating um, tens or, or even hundreds of thousands of, of crosses uh, at the very early stages of the pipeline. The movement for us is, is to take the guess out of, out of the, the whole equation here. And really when we have these massive diverse pools of genetics and we have to apply a selection pressure or a selection indices within these pools, we feel like we can be much more agile, um, we can be much faster and much more tunable in terms of responding to market needs, grower needs um, and industry needs if we start designing these uh, products from the ground up and is, is really the shift that we're making now. So um, we are starting to forward design genomes um, and, and that will be coming through in, uh, in hopefully the next couple of slides that I talk through here. This is a really great metaphor and, and, and one that really resonates with me in terms of how you sum up precision breeding. And it's this, it's this philosophy or this situation where previously we've been tasked with finding a needle in the haystack. Um, you, you create these, these very, very large diverse pools and you know that there's a piece of magic buried in there and you have to, you have to pull your way through a lot of hay to find that needle. Um, that, that is very much kind of the, the early ways of, of breeding, I'll call it. The middle graphic there is, is kind of one of the iterations along our journey where you get some of these cool tools, um, genome-wide selection, that sort of thing that, that come to your disposal. And that's really the, the magnet that the, the stick person is holding there. So you've gone from trying to find a needle in a haystack, now you've got a tool, you can kind of hover the magnet around and it will pull some of the good stuff up to the surface and, and save you some time and save you some energy. Really what we want to get to is, is the, the last uh, stick figure there where we're designing the needle. So rather than creating all of this diversity and looking for it, we're going to the customer, um, we're going to the industry and we're saying, what sort of needle do you want? How long do you want it? How, how wide or how thick do you want it? Is it magnetic? Is it non-magnetic? Does it have an eye at the end or is it homogenous all the way up? And getting this, cust uh, this um, product blueprint kind of built out where, where we've got a map or a model or a, a blueprint really for us to operate off and then we can start to, to examine what we have within our germplasm library. How that works is, is we get the design for the needle, we get the, uh, the request, we get the intent, we get the, the finished product concept. And then we need to go through and do a whole lot of mining. So we need to look at uh, our germplasm libraries. Uh, we need to make sure that we have marker sets that are built to, to basically pick up the attributes that the industry is looking for. And then it, it moves all the way through our breeding pipeline, which is represented here. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these circle by circle. So first in, in this product design um, and, and designing sort of mentality philosophy, you need concepts to start with. As I mentioned, these concepts can come from industry, uh, these concepts can come from growers, um, and these concepts can come from, from the commercial businesses in which we operate or, or touch. The nice thing about this is it does cause breeding organizations to have to have a really high degree of connectivity to the customer. And the closer that we can get to the field to understand um, what is emerging, what are the trends that are up and coming, uh, the better position we'll be in. 
Ultimately, we want to be in a position when we're anticipating problems and we're anticipating shifts in the market, we're not having to react and, and problem solve. If, if you can be really, really good at, at anticipating a problem, ideally you shouldn't have to solve for it. Secondly, once you've got your product concept, this is when you start to kind of dig through the, the pile of papers and figure out what you have that may match. Um, so as I mentioned, you need to go through your germplasm library, you need some really smart AI models that will help tease out and pull those products up to the surface that, that match the concept in which you're putting forward. You need a bunch of methods to then ingress or, or integrate those traits. Um, we, we've seen um, some really awesome performance through our TI program or, or our trait integration models where um, as, a, as a commercial business that offers transgenic crops, we have to go through a herbicide trait integration process where we take conventional or, or non-herbicide traded germplasm and we need to bring herbicide traits into it. Um, that is also a really awesome opportunity to use that herbicide trait as kind of the, the vehicle or the truck and, and to put a bunch of stuff on the trailer and kind of pull them into the genome as well. So we're able to do some integration and some integration of um, novel and, and agronomic traits, um, things like pod shatter um, and some of the disease resistances, we're able to get a really nice pull through. Um, so we need to be very smart there. Um, you, you also need really good facilities to do that. Um, the, the picture there of, uh, unfortunately it's corn, but you'll have to forgive me, we're a, a US based company and, uh, and sometimes the corn flavour continues to come through. But we do have a new facility in Marana, um, just outside of Arizona. We have seven acres under glass, a new greenhouse there that is, uh, is processing a lot of our trade integration for all of our North American crops. Then you need to get these product concepts or these finished or sort of quasi finished products into the market. You need a very prescriptive field testing uh, platform and footprint. Uh, it needs to strike an appropriate balance between trying to find a hybrid that does everything across all the acres and also um, supplements or allows for that PPP or the precision product placement. So it's, it's a very delicate, very sort of artistic balance between bringing hybrids forward that have a fit across Western Canada um, for, for canola's example um, and, and do well on all the acres from the northern BC peace country all the way down into the Red River Valley. As you can imagine, there's just a massive amount of diversity captured within that. Um, and also we need to bring products forward that have some very specific regional fits and, and, and solve problems that farmers have in very very specific geographic areas. Prescriptive testing is, is very, very difficult to do well. Um, one of the opportunities that we have within product design is, is the theoretical or the digital testing. So um, when you're starting to design products and, and you can make these theoretical digital crosses between parental lines, you then have the ability to take that theoretical outcome or, or sort of a, combo, a, a recombinant probability as, as a mass through a blup or something like that and expose it digitally to different environments, which is where this concept um, of a digital twin comes through, where you have a, uh, a seed that you can put in the ground and test. You also have a digital version of that genome that you can apply to different environmental models and see how it will react in different theoretical environmental zones. The, uh, the second one to the end there is around phenotyping. So when you have these digital models and, and when you have a large testing footprint, you need to be able to phenotype at scale. Um, one of the the big limiting factors that we face is, is this concept or this notion of, of the plant breeder going up and down the rows all summer long with an iPad or, or a pen and paper in front of them, um, <coughs> checking boxes and, and, and putting ticks and crosses against certain attributes. Our ability to, to phenotype at scale, to ingest massive amounts of information um, is, is one of our key drivers that's, that's really pushing and promoting precision breeding forward. Um, and, and one where I think we've seen a tremendous amount of investment um, and also a tremendous amount of opportunity that still exists. I, uh, <clears throat> I know even going back sort of five years ago, drones were a thing, um, but the application and the use of drones was still very much being figured out. And, and we by no means have, have that problem solved for, but we are finding more and more ways to apply drones and apply aerial imagery, uh, especially with the development of sensors now, to really bring phenotyping to the sky and, and take it off the ground. That allows you to put a lot more products through um, phenotyping critiques, um, and it also is a much more um, high throughput method that, that we can capture data from. The last one there is, is how you deploy these products to market. And, uh, and, and we're just sort of cracking into this one on the canola front now, but we are starting to see outcomes of this in our corn business in the US. With short stature corn um, now coming through into the marketplace, we had a, a pretty big year of field testing this year, and, and there will be new ways that, that products are released into the market. Um, all in all, um, I, I want everybody here hopefully to leave with the mentality that um, 
we are a science and an innovation driven company and, and we've heard just a, an awesome amount of scientific development and research that's been going on the last couple of days. Our drive and our goal is to take as much of the scientific, scientific improvement as we possibly can and find ways that we can incorporate it into a commercial pipeline. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces um, and, and it is a very big beast that we try to tame every single day and every single year. Uh, but we are really confident in, in the outcomes of this precision breeding uh, shift. Uh, we are starting to see them come through in the pipeline now and, and we're really excited for what the future holds. So this is my last slide. I'm, uh, I think now we have the opportunity to take some questions. So thank you very much. Really appreciate the time here. Well, thank you very much to all our speakers uh, for sharing their knowledge with us. Uh, I would like to invite uh, yeah, all the speakers to come to the stage for the Q&A session. And I'm not sure if we have Bradley yet with us. No, OK. Um, all right, now we can open it up for some questions. There are two channels to ask your questions. Either take the mic uh, and ask it verbally, or if you're shy or physically not in the room, you can use the Q&A um, function of the conference app. Any questions from the floor? OK, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I may have a question to leap about your CRISPR with the suspectability G. So my question is how to define the suspectability G when you screen from the model plant Arabidopsis. I believe there are a lot of G that will play function in the resistance. So from your data, it looks like the collaborative disease is still there, just the disease severity uh, is decreased, right? So how to define those screen this suspectability G? Okay, so the question is uh, how we define the susceptibility genes. So uh, uh, one simple way is uh, we look at all non-R gene or NLR genes. So we consider that is if they involved to the uh, contribute to the carb root uh, uh, infection. So there have a different uh, uh, category of, uh, you can consider as the S gene. So like uh, uh, contributed to pathogen recogni recognition at the very beginning, those genes, and also the, uh, the negative regulator that uh, suppress, suppress uh, the uh, disease resistance, those genes also can consider the S gene. Also that some genes that uh, interact with the virulent infector uh, contributed to the uh, 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 com compatible interaction. So, but uh, we not uh, limited uh, uh, any genes. Uh, the, the, they show the 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 uh, the increase uh, uh, when they knock out. They increase the resistance or reduce the susceptible susceptibility genes. We will work on that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, do you have the much difference if I define it as a functional gene? Okay, uh, you mean uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, function? Functional uh, gene, so. So uh, there have other function, right? Yeah, so no, no, just uh, related to the disease resistance, right? So it's also kind of a functional gene. So yeah. what's the difference between the functional gene and the susceptibility gene? Oh, actually, uh, some functional gene, uh, which contribute to other uh, biology process, uh, uh, those genes also involve uh, uh, susceptibility. So pathogen can use uh, some kind of uh, effector man manipulate those genes to favor uh, to pre pre uh, uh, produce a favored environment for pathogen infection so this kind of gene also can can be considered as as gene so okay, great. thank you yeah, yeah that, that is why uh, when we uh, now call those genes we also look at other uh, phenotype traits uh, uh, not affect uh, quality or yield so Uh, Eddie? Yeah. Okay, another question for uh, Li, Li Fang. Um, so kind of in addition to the previous question, so do you, do you have an idea what the actual original function is of UBC 13? I mean, the club root has obviously hijacked this, this gene. So do you have any idea of what the real function is, UBC 13? 
Okay, UBC 13 is a very conserved uh, gene. So first they found, uh, ident uh, found from the mammalian cell. They contributed to lots of uh, uh, cellular processing. Uh, one of them is uh, in innate immunity in mammalian cell. So in, in, in plant, we also found that it's very cons conserved. They contribute to different process, uh, also the stress. So we think because the UBC13 is a key E2 enzyme that contribute to the K63 polyubiquitination. So uh, it's the second uh, big uh, polyubiquitation compared to the K48. Uh, so we think uh, they involved multiple process. For sure, uh, UBC13 will contribute to lots of different uh, uh, biology process. Yeah. But obviously, you haven't seen a negative effect yet of knocking out this gene. Uh, so far in brassica napas, uh, we, we didn't see that. So maybe because they have tell those gene, and uh, also maybe we haven't uh, uh, test the detail, like the, uh, whether they uh, affect uh, quality or other things. So we will continue to uh, invest in that. Okay, my last question is, is so you had um, a knockout in five genes. Have you seen a dose effect um, in, in terms of the resistance to uh, club root? Uh, based on, based on uh, Dr. Ray's observation, she told me she found the, those mutant lines uh, uh, has uh, big seeds produced. So that is a surprise to us. So that is why uh, I show that uh, uh, yield, uh, yield figure, uh, instead of in, uh, decrease the yield, the, uh, some lines uh, increase the yield. So we, we need to look at the deta uh, more detail on that. But I'm, what I'm wondering is the dose effect towards resistance for the club root. Do you see, if you knock out two genes versus five genes, do you see a dose effect? Uh, no, we, we haven't looked at that yet. Okay. We will do that, so for sure. Do we have any Thanks. questions online? We do have some questions online. So uh, the top question for Kieran is, can you describe what your ideal design canola hybrid looks like? And the, the other, I guess, caveat to that is, how far ahead are your canola breeding analytics compared to your corn? <laughs> okay. uh, Two, uh, oh, two questions, one's a lot easier to answer than the other. Um, the, the one that's more difficult to answer or somewhat more ambiguous is what is the utopia canola hybrid look like? And I think that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, everyone wants the million acre hybrid, the, the, the hybrid that just fits, like I said, on every acre from the, the northern BC peace country all the way down to the Red River Valley. I think... Uh, <clears throat> One interesting concept that, that, that probably carries some weight moving forward is, is designing hybrids that, as an industry, we've done a really good job of focusing on the yield ceiling. Um, so that when a hybrid gets uh, the good seeding dates, it gets the right amount of moisture, it gets the right amount of heat, uh, it, it doesn't have too much disease pressure, it can really put the throttle on and, and yield really well. Um, this concept of bringing up the yield floor, um, I, I think there's a lot of merit in that. It will, uh, it will certainly even us out as an industry in terms of some of our supply and production metrics year over year. And I think from a grower standpoint, it's really interesting as well. So we, uh, we continue to see um, diverse environments. We get the question every year, when are you bringing drought tolerant canola or when are you bringing frost tolerant canola? Every year it's a different thing. Um, last year, the, the majority of the prairies was asking for drought tolerance after a really dry year. This year you talk to someone in Manitoba, uh, they were asking for canola that had a snorkel on it because it was underwater for the first few months and, and some years it's, it's frost and, and it, it, it keeps moving. I think this overall concept of bringing the yield floor up so when we have less than optimal environmental conditions, there's, there's a really strong sort of basement put in from, from a yield perspective um, or, or at least yield stability that you don't see it going really high in the good years and then falling off a cliff in the bad years is a, is a very compelling concept. Um, the second part of that question was around how far behind corn is canola, essentially? Well, your predictive analytics, Predictive basically. analytics. Um, so 
one of the benefits that we have in, in the way in which we align ourselves from a North American standpoint within Bayer is we're broken into hybrids and varietals. So the benefit that, that uh, canola has is, is we're lumped in with all of our colleagues in corn. Uh, it means we have access to the same tools. It means we have access to the same um, design elements um, within traded pipeline delivery and that sort of thing. So corn is, is, is a beast and, uh, and it occupies a lot of acres and, and is a very big uh, centerpiece for, for Bayer, uh, not just from a North American level, but from a, from a uh, global perspective as well. Um, canola is in the best spot we possibly can be to make sure that we benefit from any advancements that take place in corn and we can apply them in, uh, in our brassica crop. So hopefully, I know it's not a direct answer, but I, I don't necessarily think there is a direct answer out there. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, with regarding the uh, tilling, with regarding the tilling population, that uh, has only been exposed to one uh, mutation uh, uh, experiment. Yes. Um, with uh, canola being a polyploid, wouldn't it make more sense to do a second uh, mutation? Uh, and wouldn't you find uh, much more uh, uh, phenotypic um, differences in, in, a, in the second pollination than you do in the first? Yeah, it, it, is, it is possible. Uh, and one of the difficulties we have at this time to re-establish this population is a, we don't have really the resources to do that elaborate again. So mm -hmm. we wanted to capture what uh, George has developed and looking at uh, very, very carefully and critically uh, and given his, uh, um, George's uh, expertise and his profile, we believe the way that he conducted this mutagenesis uh, uh, is a uh, very high density, at the same time, it's not affecting the viability. So we have a very good, uh, based on his screening and based on our observations, uh, not, not the whole population, we haven't done it at. Uh, I think it is uh, pretty good. And the, uh, the first speaker also indicated that they, do, they did a second round of mutagenesis. I think it can be done, but uh, our, our issue is the resources to do that. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no more questions, I'd like to um, uh, thank all the speakers for helping uh, enhance the breeder's toolbox. And in addition to the donation to the Keith Downey's scholarship, I have a little something for them. And I'm afraid that after seeing Hermit's uh, uh, hammer and Bradley's box, these may actually come <laughs> handy. So thank you very much, everyone, for the contributions and all the great questions. And uh, we will going to have a break for lunch and meet back again here at one o'clock.